Well, good morning. I heard you all have a wonderful party last night that I miss. Thank you, Maurice Henry, David. I mean, you folks are doing a wonderful job for the implant education, perio process education, and I must amend you for that. Uh, it's always a privilege to be invited to speak in any um, symposium, and this one is really special. Um, what we're going to be spending time to this morning talk about tissue changes around implants in the aesthetic zone, especially when you put an implant immediately into a socket. What will happen long term to those uh, tissue? And what can we do to avoid tissue pro aesthetic problems? And to begin with, I'm going to introduce to you to this dear patient of mine. As you can see, I first saw her in 1997. And uh, the pro problem is a failing left central incisor, as you notice on the radiograph. Back then, um, I did what you call immediate tooth replacement. Extraction, implant in, and put a provisional in there right away. Now, for those of you who have been around for some time, you know around 1996, 97 is the time when people first start doing what you call immediate tooth replacement. And uh, this was, in fact, for this specific type of procedure, is case number five for me. And this is uh, the same patient in 2003. You can see I annually follow her up, and uh, you can see the results actually looks very, very, very decent. In fact, I did publish this case for those of you who are into the literature. And in fact, after I did the publication, um, I have at least five implant companies contacted me and say, hey, Joe, you know, we would like to have some sort of affiliation with you. We would like to put you on the podium. So in a sense, to a certain degree, this case put me onto the lecture circuit. Now, I lost track of her since 2005. As you all know, now we are really into this thing called uh, social media such as Facebook, and in my iPhone, there's this app called uh, LinkedIn. I'm sure a lot of you have it. And la early last year, I have a request to connect, and it's from this patient of mine. So I was really grateful. I said, wow, you know, I'm glad that I found her. And she emailed me. She said, you know what, I'm so gra grateful that I found you. Then in my mind, I said, hey, this is going to be great. I'm going to recall her, and now I have a 16-year follow-up. I'm going to blow everybody away how wonderful this procedure is. And as I read on the email, she said, you know, I'm so, besides gratefully, I, I, I got reconnected to, to you. I actually urgently need to see you. When I saw the word urgently, trust me, the hair on my back stand up a little bit. <laughs> and I say, what is the issue? She said, well, it's hard for me to describe to you. I'm going to have my husband grab his digital camera and take a picture and email you. Trust me, for the next two nights, keep waiting for that email to think on my inbox. I didn't sleep very well. And when that email finally showed up, I clicked on the attachments. Trust me, if there's anything to use the word humble, it really humbled me. It took me to, the, to my knees, all right? What happened? What went wrong? Tissue changes. Well, I'm sure a lot of you do immediate tooth replacement. But do you ever see problems like that? or never, right? Only in California, right? Maybe. So, and, and, and the worst thing is she told me, you know what? Uh, actually, she had moved back to India, all right? Her husband is uh, actually a CEO of a company, very well off family. She said, you know what? I'm coming back to see you. You know, sometimes it's not to have patient coming back insisting to see you. And so, in April last year, when she flew in, I took some pictures. I always wonder, why does camera need to be, have such high resolutions, okay? You know? <laughs> You know, I, I mean, you know, and, and it's not a good sensation, all right? When you look at the periapical radiograph, it looks great. However, when you look at the CBCT images, it doesn't look that great. And you can see the flash of the implant shining through. So, what are, why are we here today? Tissue changes. Focusing on immediate implant placement, what are some of the problems? In fact, when you look at the literature, when you hear great speakers, you know, along the way, you know, Henry, Maurice, you know, Dennis Tarnow, you, they, uh, Stephen Chu, they all could talk, tell you about, sometimes you run into these type of problems. What are they? Such as facial gingival changes, discolorations, or facial contour changes. So what I'm going to do to you today is this. Along the way, not only to tell you what causes these type of problems, in 2014, can we do anything to minimize these problems? What do we know from a research standpoint? And 
not, not, but not least, I'm going to show you some long-term data, the last 15 years. What happens to each one of this, from discoloration to facial contour changes to facial ginger recession? And I think it's interesting, something for you to, you may want to ponder about. And what I'm going to do is throughout you know, the, the session, I'm going to use this patient as an example. Patient actually flew in from Minnesota to Los Angeles to see me. Problem is a failing left central incisor. And as you can see, the dynamics of the gingiva as well as the smile line, I'm sure the other speakers talk about, it makes this case to be not an easy scenario to, to treat with. Not only that, you notice patients have an active infection going on there, there too. Now, in order to look at gingiva, we must go back to biology. And for when we look at implant, you know, uh, in the aesthetic zone, there's a few factors that one must ponder because these are the elements that will affect the dynamics of the gingival long term. So let's quickly go through each one of them and we'll go back and see how we treat our patient. Let's talk about thickness, gingival thickness. And to evaluate gingival thickness is a very subjective matter. What I like to do personally is utilize a periodontal probe, probe the sulcus, and then to see whether I can see the outline of the probe shining through. If you can see the probe, what that's telling you is the gingival is on the thinner side. As we all know, the thinner the gingiva, we like to call those dental losers. Why? Because upon surgical and or restorative insult, the chance of gingival recessions could be high, right? And we'll spend some time talking about tissue graft. Will that help the situation? Now, we all know, I mean, you know, the Atlanta team for years has been talking about the importance of the bone because it sets the tone of everything. We know now, in order for gingiva, we got a bone underneath that to support it. So, we all know underneath the facial aspect of every tooth, failing tooth, if you open up the gums, you will expect to see a layer of bone. The question we want to ask ourselves is how far should that bone be ideally underneath that gingiva? And to answer this question, I'm going to share with you two published articles that to confirm this thinking process. The first one was published over 50 years ago by Gargilo, Wenz, and Orban. And what they did is on ca cadavers, they took out the jaw, the teeth, and they did histo histology, evaluating the area between the gingival margin to the bone circumferentially around the tooth. Right now, let's focus on the facial, all right? And there's actually two things I would like you to remember from these publications at this point. First thing is this. Histologically, they noticed there's three components underneath between the gingival margin to the underlying bone, the sulcus, junctional epithelium, and the connective tissue attachments. More important than anything else, we know that if the patient's tooth is periodontally sound and the tooth has been erupted in a normal sequence, the average distance between gingival margin to the bone is approximately three more meters. Typically, that's the number what we want, want to see in any aesthetic reconstruction because that serves kind of like a foundation. Now, this is a histological study. Can we apply this thinking process from a clinical setting? Absolutely. My friend John Coyce did publish this. And what he noticed is on human being, his patients, maxillary anterior teeth, he first anesthetized those teeth and he took a periodontal probe and he did bone sounding on the facial aspect of those teeth. By doing so, he was able to categorize his patient into three groups based on the distance between gingival margin to the underlying bone, the normal high and low crest. Well, what he called normal is, has a distance of three more meters, similar to what Gargilo talked about. Then, of course, they have this variation. High is less than three, and low is greater than three. The key point you want to remember is this. Not only we need bone to support soft tissue, we realize now there's indeed a cohesive relationship between gingival to its underlying bone. And that relationship on the facial aspect of the tooth tends to be around three more meters. In other words, once the distance between gingival to the bone exceeded greater than three more meters, such as in a low crest environment, upon surgical and or restorative insult, you increase the risk of gingival recession. It's that simple. So the key point is normally, Gingival to bone distance, facially is three more meters. Now, let's take our thinking process one step further. How, when we put an implant into the equation, how would that work? Well, maybe before that, let's look at our patient from Minnesota. How about that? I anesthetized her, did a bone sounding on the, her, her failing tooth, less than three more meters. I told myself, hey, that's good. Now, what happens if we put the implant, the platform of the implant, that is, deeper than the bone? 
what, what do I mean by platform to implant? You see the white arrow? That's the platform. That's where the restorative dentists connect the prosthesis to the implant. If you put that platform deeper than the bone, what, what do you think is going to happen? Can bone be sustained above the platform of the implant? Well, let's take a look at this to be published prospective data here. What the authors did here is they prospectively evaluated the six implants. Essentially, the study is very simple. Extraction, all the implants are placed in the aesthetic zone only. That means K9 to K9 in the maxilla, immediate implant placement, immediate provisionalization. One of the variables they analyze is the bone loss around that implant. Two things I want to, you, you to look at. The first thing is this, bone loss via standardized radiograph, mesial distally. When you look, not well, essentially, you, you can separate these six implants into two groups. The five implants on the right, one implant on the left. Why? The five implants on the right processes what you call kind of platform shifting, platform switching type capabilities that you're well worth, worth about. Now, when we evaluate the bone loss, at one year, you'll notice that there's actually significant less bone loss on the platform shifting and switching group. Now, I want you to look at this. Bone remain at or above the platform of the implant. What the authors mean is this. Right after surgery, they take an X-ray, identify all the proximal sites in which the bone were sitting at or above the platform of the implant. Above means coronal to the platform of the implant. One year later, they take that X-ray again. The question is, they want to see what happens those, how many of those sites in which at surgery, the bone were sitting at or above the platform of the implant still remain at or above the platform of the implant one year later. When you look at the percentages, interesting. Two things I want you to be aware of. First, the platform shifting group, again, outperformed the non-shifting group. But more important than the other, when you look at that percentage on the platform switching group, though it looks great, but what do you think is going to happen to this percentage, these nice looking numbers, if you wait two years, three years, six years, ten years later? Some of the boats, this percentage most likely is going to go down somewhat. My point is this, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, we have some wonderful materials nowadays, implant systems and so forth, but we're still fighting against biology. Unfortunately, unless you are someone up there, you cannot alter biology. We can only change so much. All right. So to answer the question, can bone stay above the platform of the implant? In general, not really. But with the newer design implants, we can get it closer. All right. Let's go back to our patients. Now we know for this patient, the gingival is thin, and you know that if you were to extract this tooth, the chance of losing the gingival architecture is going to be great. So. I want to do immediate implant placement. But the problem is there's an infection there. Then what do we do? Active infection. Now, how many of you are brave enough to put an implant in an active infected site? You know, I always tell my students, if you're not going to do that to your mother-in-law, please don't do it to the patient. All right? Well, you know, some of you, I, I know, I know, I got the picture, I got the picture. But anyways, so what do I do? Well, on situations like that, you know, it's kind of like a double-edged situa sort situation. So I, I always, Ask myself, all right, if, is there any way, if the gingival architecture looks good on that, for that fading tooth, and the bone architecture is within normal limits still there, there may be some defects, but still there, in presence of the active infection, under such circumstances, what I'll do is I ask myself, is there any way I can control that infection all the while maintaining the tooth there? In other words, keeping the tooth and maintain the gingival architecture. And this is precisely what I did for this case here. I did a little tunneling incision, drain the infection, go in there and just clean things out, put the patient on antibiotics, systemic and locally. And fortunately, I was able to control the infection. So now let's take our thinking process to the next step. Talk about implant placement, huh? Um, a traumatic extraction, make sure the buccal bone is still intact. And when we talk about implant placement, let's talk about how should you engage the implant into the bony socket when you do immediate implant placement? In fact, the key to the success is actually stability. And this is kind of like a classical picture that people want to look at. You look at the, the extraction socket. There. Why? What you want is the implant to be parallel to the socket. As people like Salamis have been talking about, you know, in, I mean, make, the, make the, that osteotomy parallel to the socket. All right? to leave a gap between implant and buccal bone. That's what we want to strive for. Now, how do you select implant diameter and how would that affect 
the implant success, I mean aesthetic success, in my opinion, there are two factors that govern that, the size of the gap and the size of the socket. Let's first of all talk about the size of the gap. What size should we leave there? Or is, is there a guideline? People often talk about two more meters. Is it needed? Is it possible? Well, maybe we, before we even talk about the gap size, we should step back and ask ourselves, if in presence of a gap, should we even graft there or not? Well, I think a recent publication, just what, couple of this, early this year by Salamis, Dennis Tano, and so forth, kind of clearly addressed that issue. But let me highlight it a little bit more to you. Okay, should we graft or not? I'm going to show you these three patients here. Now, this patient represents three time frames. And what we did is this, we treated now, first of all, why three time frames? Because this basically summarizes in every possible method, when you do immediate implant placement in an so anterior socket, how you manage the gap. In my humble opinion, there are no other ways right now. There are three methods that people commonly use. And I'm going to use these three time periods to show you the three ways. Now, why I change this, as you notice. I said first, finished my specialty training in 1998, okay? So why I keep changing, all right? Because the difference is what I do is I try my best to follow up those patients, all my patients that I've treated. And I'm just like you. When I, the way I do things, I listen to people lecture, and I say, hey, this is what they do. And if the superstar is doing that, I better go home and do it. I mean, go back to my clinic, not home, okay? So, and I better do that. And so I follow the way, and a few years later, when I notice, when I follow those patients, I notice, oops, we have some problems, then I better change. And so there comes the changes there, right? So each group, the first two groups have over 100 follow-up. The last group has over 38 follow-ups. Let's take a look, at, and I'm going to just use one as an example. Now, what are the different methodologies to handle the gap? Very early on, I followed a rule published by Knox. If the gap is greater than 1.5, no graft. So most cases, no grafting. Let's see what happened. Second group, I always graft into the gap. Now, more recently, when I noticed that second group has some issues too, so I take the thinking process one step further. Not only I graft inside the gap, I also graft outside there too, all right? So let's take a look at what happened. Situation number one here. And we want to focus looking at the facial incisal contour, looking at the facial contour. And you notice, Though you notice the, the, this photo was taken right after surgery, flapless surgery, immediate provisionalization with a customized abutment before the provisional place. This is nine months later with the definitive abutment and this six-year follow-up. What do you see to the facial contour? Hmm. But the interesting thing is this. Is this an isolated incidence or is it a trend? When we follow up over 142 cases, this is what we notice, okay? Actually, in this one here, 95 so far, 69%, 69%. Wow, significant. When we look at this patient, what, one year and six years, you know, and six years follow up graph, it looks great again. But you notice, no buckle bone, probably the implants are showing through. In fact, this patient complained to me, when I reflect the flap, I see this. Now, is this a success or failure? What do you think? Well, let me tell you, the way I quantify success or failure is really depending on who did this surgery. <laughs> because you know how it is. If it's my patient, which is my patient, don't worry, everything will be under control. I can take care of you, right? With someone else did it, who the heck? was a crazy surgeon that drank that 10 margarita last night, okay? So, anyways, how about, you know, in this situation here, when I graph in gap, let's take a look at what happened. Four-year follow-up, partial collapses. Now, how often do we see this type of changes when we graph in the gap? Interestingly enough, 30%. One-third of the time, okay? Now, is this a big deal? Well, let's take a look in a little bit here. Now, how about when we graph inside and outside? All right? You know, here we, we graph inside, put sinograph, allograph outside membrane, connect to tissue, graph too. And you can see the healing from three weeks, six months to four years. And 
I want you to pay attention. When you put a lump of bone there, and we're doing a, conducting a study right now, when we do different type of graph materials, xenograph, allograph, or torturous graph for buccal contour, and we measure the contour changes, surprisingly enough, you will see uh, most cases have significant bone grafting changes. So it's not like one plus one equals to two. Bone graft is not never one plus one equals to two. You'll be lucky to get 1.6. And on a bad day, you may 1 plus 1 end up getting 0 0.7, all right? So, but anyways, you can see the contour, you know, it's still maintained, but it's not like a lump of bone there. And when you look at the incisal facial contour change at four years, you notice, actually, quite nice. Now, how often do we have contour changes problem, or is it perfect when we do it this way? Still 7% of the cases. Still 7%, all right? All right, so now, this is the number. Mind you, I'm not here to tell you what to do. You do your own choice. But when you, you know, read, read Dennis and, and Henry and Marie's article in January International Journal of Peri-Restorative Dentistry, I think it also gives you some interesting idea. All right? So now, how about recession? Now, remember the three factors, recession, discoloration, and you know, I mean, facial contour changes, they tend to go hand in hand to each other. If one thing's gone, the other one potentially has a problem. What do we notice when we follow this group here? Interestingly enough, you're not getting significant amount of recession. No graph group, okay? On an average, eight year follow up, two more meters. That's a range zero to four. And how about when you graph in gap? One more meter recession on an average. When you graph gap and outside, almost one. All right, so interestingly enough, facial contour collapses, you know, but the thing is, you don't get a lot of recession. I mean, you do get recession, but still, I want to, you to look at, despite everything, the mean is around one to two more meters. Some of you say not too bad, but you know what? The biggest thing is when you graph, compare to different graph group, this is the key point, ladies and gentlemen, the range. When you don't graph, you notice some cases there's no recession, but some cases, four more meters plus recession. The range is, you know, the deviation is much, much far greater when you compare to, you know, the group that you graphed. So my, in my opinion, that minimal you can do is just at least put bone graft in the gap. But, you know, then, is there any benefit of grafting outside you? Well, I think this is the key right here. All right? How about discoloration? When we compare that, interesting. All right? Now, we know that given when you don't graft, discoloration, you know, I mean, when it collapses in, high chance of discoloration. But how about when you graph outside too? Some cases still a little bit of discoloration. My point is this, even with modern day zirconia abutments and so forth, there's no way you can guarantee. And I'm sure if you're truthful to yourself, many cases, even if you do everything right, you look at the ginger, still there's a slight change in color. I mean, you know, the best thing to do is when you show cases, you just, you know, use Photoshop and lighten it you know, put that histogram really far to the left, then everything looks great, okay? So anyways, what did we learn here? Should we graph or not? Well, it's better to graph, all right? But when you look at this situation here, I put the bone graph into the gap, and nine months later, when I reflect the gingiver, I actually ask the patient, did you mind? Okay, she said, don't mind. So, but if you look at it, does it preserve the, uh, the, the buckle plate? Not really. Now, why? Well, it depends on who you believe in. But one of the publications by people like co-author Jan Lindy, they talk about that buckle bone. The point is, it doesn't matter what, what you do. Even if you don't put bone graft or bone graft into a gap, that buckle bone, the chance of it disappearing is high because of the disappearance of the bundle bone, all right? So if that's the concept, we, the question is, what gap size should we leave in there? In my humble opinion, the purpose of the gap is for prosthetic and aesthetics. Why? Because, in my opinion, you want to leave a big enough gap so that after, it, after that inherent remodeling of the buckle bone, now mind you, the graph you put in there will remodel too. It's just the way life is. It seldom just stay 100%. So that means every time you extract the tooth, even you put bone graft in there, there will be buckle bone remodeling. Okay? And so the point is, if you put an implant too far buckly, you'll be in trouble. So why we leave a big size gap is to compensate for facial reach remodeling. So at the end of the day, after all the remodeling, there should be still ideally at least one to 1.5 millimeter of bone 
buckle to it to minimize aesthetic problems, all right? In other words, if you put an implant and leave the gap tube closed after the remodeling, you may get yourself in trouble. All right, so with that in mind, let's to understand that what is the average horizontal reach remodeling? Well, these are some of the highly referenced publications out there talk about reach remodeling. Very simple. Extract the tooth, measure the buccolingual reach width dimension, and then either put bone graft or bone, no bone graft into the socket. Then six months later or one year later, measure, open the flap, measure the reach change again. Now, the last two has a green asterisk. They have an implants in the socket. What do you see from there? Is it better to graph or not to graph? What do you think, ladies and gentlemen? Well, obvious. It's better to graph, right? But when you look at grafting, I want you to notice minus 1.2, 1.5. What does that mean, ladies and gentlemen? This is a key point to bring home. It's better to graph. However, even despite grafting, it only minimizes but does not completely eliminate horizontal bone changes. All right, that makes sense. We know that. Now, the next question is this, which area, buckle or lingual, do you think remodel the most? Buckle, right? Obviously. And which area affect aesthetics the most? Buckle. So with that in mind, we want to focus. How much buckle changes can we expect? What do we know from the literature? Well, this article published in 2012 attempt to address that. What they did is immediate implant placement, take a CBCT scan, one, and put bone graft in the buckle gap. One year later, take that CBCT scan, and they were able to use some software to, be, to create a standardization. All right? Looking, focusing on the buckle plate changes at various distance along that implant body. Now, I just want to show you the mean data. Let's take a look. You notice negative all across the board, vertically, horizontally. So the buckle bone changes somehow, right? Now, what the point is this, where do you think majority of the bone Remodeling occur. Where? Crestal, absolutely. All right, interesting. Now, if I were to call this crestal area zone A, and I'm going to label, divide the buckle plate into three areas. I'm going to call this zone B, and I'm going to call this zone C. Ladies and gentlemen, for you as surgeons, if you need to go do bone regeneration at each one of the three zones, may I ask you, which one of these three zones is the most difficult to regenerate from bone standpoint? What do you think? Hey, you're all A students. I totally agree. All right. So, when, upon listening to that, I almost want to kneel down on the floor and look up at the sky and say, why? You know, zone A is the area that we model the most once you extract the tooth. And zone A is the most difficult to regenerate. And which area affects aesthetic the most? Zone A. Oh, okay. So, let's take our thinking process just one step further. You know, just for the sake of looking at, you know, is the bundle bone issue really affect that buckle plate? So, I ask myself, what is the average buckle bone thickness? Because if you notice, on an average, half a millimeter to one millimeter of buckle contour changes there. This to be published articles using CBCT, what they did is measure the buckle bone thickness of teeth in the aesthetic zone, you notice the key point to remember is very simple. On an average, buckle plate of teeth in the aesthetic zones are thin on an average one millimeter or less. And that coincides with all the publications out there. All right, let's draw a summary of what we've learned. We know that buckle bone thickness for teeth in the aesthetic zone on an average one millimeter thick. We know despite putting bone graft into the gap, you will still get a certain degree of remodeling based on the publications up to 1.5 millimeters. So the question is, what size gap should we leave in there? Now, remember, the gap is to compensate for that facial re rich remodeling. So hopefully, at the end of the day, after all the remodeling, the implant will still be encased by bone to minimize aesthetic crisis. So if you calculate the numbers, let me tell you, absolutely minimal is 1.5. Of course, the bigger, the better. If I can do what Dan has shown on this wonderful article a few years back on that K9, what, seven, eight millimeter gap? I mean, if I can do that every day, I'm so happy. All right, but unfortunately, most of the time I cannot do that. You know that. All right, so this is what we learned. Gap size 1.5. How about socket size? Well, how will socket size affect implant diameter? Let me show you this picture. I just extracted a left central incisor there. I put a probe there, nine millimeters, they say. All right, and what size implants would you put in there? Most people, they, may, they select implant diameter by doing that. And if you leave at least 
two more meters distance between the implant and the adjacent teeth, your numbers come up to be five more meters. Well, before you put five more meter implant on this patient, I want you to look at the patient from this standpoint. In size only. Again, I put a probe in there and say seven more meters. Would you still put that five more meter implant in there? Absolutely not. If you do the calculations, you need at least 1.5 to 2 millimeters buccally. You need at least one millimeter palatally. The point is, for sure, you will not do that. All right. In fact, nowadays, if I were to put an implant that's greater than 4.8 millimeters, you know, in the aesthetic zone, then my nurse hand me one of those. Trust me, I will stop and think 20 times. Is it really needed, ladies and gentlemen? Because you know what? Unlike conventional wisdom say, bigger is better, actually bigger is not so better in an extraction socket, all right. So, key point is this, buccal lingual dictate implant diameter. Is, does that mean we should never use mesial distal dimension? Not really, only if it's narrow of the two. All right, so now, why is this significant? This article, look, what they did is this. They use a caliper, well, I don't know where they use a caliper, okay? But they did a measurements of the buccal lingual dimension of the tooth cervically. That dimension, mind you, is greater than the socket width dimension, all right? Greater. That means what you have to work with, the socket size is actually slightly smaller than that. And when you look at this number, hmm, interesting. What size socket do you think if you, to, you need in order to put a five millimeter implant in there? Probably almost eight millimeters. You don't get that that often. Think about it. All right, so to summarize, since majority of socket size is seven millimeter or less, and minimally to minimize aesthetic problems, you got to have a gap at least 1.5 and fill the gap with bone. Implant seldom should be greater than 4.5. Think, rethink, rethink. All right, so now I want to take you back to my patient from India. You know I'm not, you know, you, know you don't want me to get off the hook on that, right? And when she come back 16 years later, you know, I was so nervous and stressed. It was a crisis for me, you know. But after, what, when I started treatment, you know, I wasn't, I, I wasn't feeling good. But after a while, I asked myself, you know what? I should be very honored. How often do I have a second chance to correct a mistake 16 years later, all right? So what I did is this. I went in there. I asked myself, what is wrong with this problem? I go back to my slide 16 years ago. I dust it off, I scan it, I show you. This picture, I took it right at surgery when I, after I did a pickup impression of the implant. What's wrong with this picture? Three things. Number one, implant's too big. Number two, implant's too buckle. Last but not least, 16 years ago, I did not put bone graft in the gap there. So, but the problem is, patients say, can you solve the problem? Money is not the object. That's the only consolation. Money is not the object, okay? So what I did is this. She said, I'm staying in Southern California for two, in, for two months for you to treat me. Well, well, if implant is no good, doesn't matter what type of grafting you do, it's not going to solve the facial gingival problem. You got to remove it. And trust me, when I remove that implant, you know, I always tell my residents, if you're a good surgeon, you got to have a heart like a lion, fingers like a butterfly. That particular day, trust me, my heart was like a butterfly, my finger was like a lion crawl, okay? <laughs> I still put that implant in there, but the point is this, I want you to look at 1997, 2013, what a big change in our thinking process, isn't that right, Henry Maurice, okay? You, we all know, we used to say bigger the better, but now we know it's actually, you know, 16 years later, I got so scared, I looked for the smallest implants available in my, in my office there and plug it in there. I put a provisional in there. Now, this is two months before she fly back to India. But the worst thing is, you know, she said, I still don't like it, but I will be back. You know, it reminds me of a movie. <laughs> you know, I have been just been terminated. And so, you know, that was 2014, and April 2000, uh, uh, this year, she flew back, and this is how she looked like. And I had my plan, I said, you know what? I'm gonna tell her, you need crown lengthening surgery. <laughs> but she told me, uh, 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 I don't want crown lengthening surgery. But I said, you do need a little bit. No, 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 I don't want you to touch anything else. But I, I want my gingival back. Oh, great, you know. 
take your money back. So I say, all right, let's go for one more adventure here, all right? So I go in there, you know, uh, do, you know, what I did is I even further flattened out the emergence profile, and I'm sure Dennis may talk a little bit about that with people like Steve Chu, and then, you know, we go in there, graft, you know, coronal advanced flap, over grafted, you know, put my piece of little sashimi in there, you can see, all right? And then, uh, you know, so you can see, you know, when I saw the patient last year, and she stayed in California for five weeks, and then, you know, she just left, actually, okay? And so you can see, you know, five year, five weeks, you know, post-op, and I just say a little prayer. Every case, I always say a little prayer. Please teach you God, help me out. And I, I think I, I, I have, may have solved this, okay? Uh, sometimes you'll knock on wood. No, seriously. So, going back to the situation, let's draw a summary. Buckle bone, one more meters, we know that, right? Grafting into the gap, still remodeling up to 1.5. So therefore, the gap should be at least 1.5 more meters. Now, we also talk about since the socket size, buccolingually, which determine implant diameter size, she, mo most of the time, seven more meters or less for teeth in the aesthetic zone. Therefore, most of the time, implant dimensions should be 4.3 or less. That's the equation here. All right, so now, what you just learned is this. We know it's good, put a impl small implant, set it back, put a gap there, put graph in gap, and it's great, right? But that still does not eliminate the fact that no matter what biology, because of biology, once you extract the tooth, buccal contents could change. And you cannot guarantee there will be absolutely no remodeling or doesn't matter what type of graph you use, BMP, PPP, GG, whatever you do. Doesn't matter, all right? So, but the thing is, the ultimate goal is to try to minimize that contour change too, right? As you can see, again, you know, I keep referencing that article by Tanel Salamis and, and so forth, okay? So, you know, what can we do? Well, in 2014, there's only two things we can do, potentially. One, a little bit controversy, but you know, I just review, uh, I just look at the IJO meet, they have like a 40 or 50 case report on this type of procedures, okay? They do what you call root shield, all right? Now, I'm not here to condone that. I mean, in fact, I'm not a big fan of doing facial root shield because, you know, the best type of tooth to keep to, to do this type of procedure, actually, usually it's the type of teeth that you don't need to extract at the, at the first place, to be honest, okay? So, and how often do you get that? Not often. So, so the concept is this, I mean, like I said, I don't really do it that much. And the other one is you grab outside, like we talk about. All right, so what do you mean by root shield here? Since I don't really do that many of those facial root shield cases, I, I only do kind of like the proximal ones. And still with that, although clinical results is good, but I still put a lot of skeptics in my mind there. I'm trying to follow and see, is it going to happen or not? But this is the idea. So you're trying to fool nature that the tooth is still there, but actually the tooth is, is gone, and you, can, you didn't replace it with an implant. I know one of my really talented colleagues that worked with me a lot, and, and you can see this the one-year result. Now, notice, if you look at the color-wise, still not, still not great. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, it, and, and I'm not here to criticize someone else's work, but you, that's why I'm talking about the discoloration, ladies and gentlemen. It's not so easy. Not so easy. All right. So anyways, now, how about when we graph outside? Sometimes grafting outside also presents a certain other set of challenges. Okay. People talk about, you know, I mean, speakers on the, uh, uh, down here sitting, talk, they talk about papillary sparing incision. All right. People like Dennis and so forth. But sometimes, okay, Having an incision there, you know, versus flapless, there's a little bit controversy because if you don't flap it, it's hard to graft very nicely. But when you flap it, when you make that vertical releasing incision, now, people always say they're scared, scared, scared of scarring, to be honest. It's a little bit misnomer because due to the collagen content or lack of collagen content, when you compare the attached t tissue compared to like the mucosal tissue, most of the time, you see scarring at the mucosal tissue, but less so at the, at the, uh, at the uh, I mean, attached tissue there, okay? But then, then you say, what's the big deal? Well, the big, big deal is actually collagen sometimes is like our, an, our ally too, all right? Because without collagen, sometimes you get clefting and groovings. And when you get groovings, guess what happened? In the aesthetic zones, shadows hit it, and it creates that little, you know, un unpleasant effect there. So what do we do? When we go back to our patients from Minnesota, when anytime, you know, when people fly long distance, it's never a good thing, 
Okay, well, it's a good thing when they fly long distance, but then usually we'll tell you, you know what, Dr. Ken, I've been searching around. You are the best, you know. Trust me, okay. I, it used to give me that letter S on my chest, it, you know, the man of steel sensation, never anymore. Because I know nowadays, quickly, if I'm not careful, I got a different type of S on my chest, <laughs> okay? And that S starts with the letter A. You all know what I mean, okay? So, when you look at a situation, what do we do? Well, if I just imagine on thin ginger butter, high smile line, and, and when you look at dynamic ginger, if for this patient, I were to make an incision, okay? Make an incision right there. What do you think? Maybe a problem, right? So, you know, I told myself, well, maybe I should hide all my incisions underneath that lips there. Hide underneath the curtain there. So, this to be published material is just a conceptual thing, okay? What the authors look at is, all right, can we just kind of like do a little tunneling and just do all the grafting, you know, because mind you, that's for grafting outside. So now, how does it work? Let's put everything together, at least from my humble observation and opinion. Basically, you know, for this situation, I was able to, like I say, control that infection, fortunately, and did immediate implant placement and used the rules that we've been talking about, grafting on the buccal bone, and then now, and put, we're going to put a provisional to support the gingival architecture as well. And the double incision there, sometimes I just do a single incision, all right? But now, remember, there will be scarring because mucosal tissue, you're going to see a big fat white band of scarring because of the collagen. But you know what? I'll take scarring any day. It's not a big deal, okay? As long as the, the lip is underneath that scar. Most of the time, patients say it's going to be okay. All right, so just use a you know, piece of um, resolvable membrane, and, and sometimes I don't even do that nowadays. I'm just doing a little comparative thing, okay? And like a T-shape, and I graft underneath there. And um, uh, then I do a little sashimi here, okay? You know, and a little hamachi sashimi, my favorite there. And it actually looks like a little shrimp here, you know. Maybe it's a shrimp sashimi, okay. In Japanese, they call it amabi, okay. So, what the, this, the way the thinking process is. The bone normally is three more meters underneath the facial gingiva. And in this situation, remember, we ascertained it with bone sounding. Now, where does the soft tissue graft go? It's going to go right here. All right. In fact, crestally, if you look at the picture on the right, this is how I position the tissue graft here. When I do this sort of tissue graft, I like to categorize this sort of tissue graft as certain immediate implant placement into two groups. Okay? One, one technique is this, I call it the scarf technique. The other one is I do a full tunneling on the facial and just slide that piece of connective tissue graft there. Or you can just raise the full flap and pluck that big piece of sashimi there. So what is the rationale behind this one here? Well, where will the bone go? The bone is going to go underneath the tunnel, and I, I like to overgraft it, all right? Put, use my finger to mold it almost into the shape of the root. And now, what is the reason of this? You know, what's the reason? This is my thinking process. I mean, you know, I may be wrong too. Now, remember when we look at this here, where does majority of the bone, bone remodeling occur? On the buccal plate? Remember? The crestal region, right? Okay. And this is the area that bone regeneration, GBR, is the most difficult to attain. So, under such circumstances, my rationale is, all right, but it's hard to regenerate bone there, but we can potentially thicken up the soft tissue there. We know we can get success there. If I can successfully thicken up the tissue to compensate that for that difficult zone area and the rest of the area, I utilize bone grafting to, to deal with that. This is the thinking process, okay? So, Again, this, is, uh, this picture on the left was taken approximately four, four to five days after the surgery. Again, the key is to overgraft. Of course, you can see that there's a little swelling there in the screw retained provisionalization. This is uh, eight days later, all right? Um, this is 10 months still with the provisional. Remember, patients flying from Minnesota, so long distance. And again, 10 months. Now, I want you to look at this with the provisional. With all this, you look at the color of the gingiva, what do you think, all right? I mean, is it 100% match? Is it that perfect? I don't think so. I mean, it's good enough, but you know what? Unfortunately, in 2014, I mean, it's hard to get it, at least under my own two hands, um, better than what I can achieve there, all right? So anyways, if you look at the contour, you can see at pre-surgery and at 10 months, you know, 
I, I can see, I think you will agree with me, there's a certain degree of benefits of overgrafting outside too, to try to maintain or minimize the changes, inevitable changes. Some of you are concerned about if you don't put some sort of barrier in there like a membrane, just utilizing provisional to seal the socket, what, what's going to happen to that bone graft? Well, basically this is what you see here. And Dan is probably going to say that he would like to see more bleeding in there, but, you know, I mean, I will take this, okay? Uh, you know, like to use open tray impressions and, and to, use, to, to try to duplicate the gingival architecture there. As you know, under contour, the emergence profile, which is popular nowadays, but remove cementation sometimes can be a challenge. Please be careful of that. Definitive restoration, there's a one year follow up. I want you to pay attention to the benefits of protecting the gingival architecture of the pro provisional, yet overgrafting that buckle with the tissue grafter. All right? So again, one year follow up, that's one year after the, the, the definitive restorations there. Okay, now where do we make the incision? I tell the patient, smile as big as you can. This is where I start my incision, all right? So two and a half year follow up. But you can see the color, there's still a little changes in color there. All right, so again, I want you to look at the picture on the right there. I think that if you, you know, I mean, flapless surgery sometimes is double edged sword. You know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, like, uh, like sometimes you cannot see things, but if you raise the flap, you will not be able to duplicate the dynamics of things there. So this is a three-year follow Again, I think you appreciate the dynamics of the tissue. So ladies and gentlemen, I mean, just give you a glimpse of how things work. You know, tissue changes is inevitable. Discoloration, inevitable. Contour changes, inevitable. But we can only do a few things here to minimize things. To be honest, aesthetic tissue management is humbling, extremely humbling. Once again, Harry, Maurice, David, and all my friends out there, it is a privilege. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.